we discussed a couple of Goshos ago uh, in that long Gosho about uh, securing the correct teaching for peace in the land. Um, Nietzsche spent a great deal of that Gosho um, explaining that the current popular movements going on in Japan were in fact um, incorrect. Incorrect historically, incorrect as far as admonitions and teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha himself and certainly throughout the scholarship from India to China to Japan and the great teachers from uh, Nargarjuna and Vasubandhu all the way through Tendai, Dengyo, Miaolo, uh, I'm jumping around, but from China to Japan. Uh, Nichiren is displaying his scholarship and he's saying, you guys are wrong, wrong, wrong. And, of course, that peed off a lot of people in power. And so he ended up getting exiled to the Izu Peninsula, a place called Ito. So, uh, the reason I bring this up is because this next ghost show that I'm going to read uh, is uh, later, after he wrote that, he wrote these other letters and so forth, and then he wrote a... I, you know, when you use the word justification, it sounds like you're uh, making excuses. Uh, but that's not what we mean here. Uh, he writes this Gosho, uh, the teaching of the um, time, uh, capacity, and uh, country, um, as a, a further, if you will, discussion, um, really call, harkens back to that uh, earlier Gosho uh, about the Nembutsu and the uh, and the correct teaching. And what he does here is he goes back into some of his voluminous scholarship and he talks about um, why he's not just talking through his butt, that there's, uh, there's actual uh, teachings, sermons, transcriptions, that bolster, not only bolster what he says, but are the reason he says what he says. So he feels uh, the scholarship supports his, uh, his view. And so um, here we go with the teaching capacity, time, and country. Um, with regard to the first item, the teaching consists of all the sutras, rules of monastic discipline, and treatises expounded by the thus come one Shakyamuni Comprising 5,048 volumes contained in 480 scroll cases, the teachings of Buddhism, after circulating throughout India for a thousand years, were introduced to China 1,015 years after the Buddha's passing. During the 664-year period beginning with that year, the 10th of the Yuping era, is common era 67, uh, the year 67, Cyclic sign Hinoto-u in the reign of Emperor Ming of the latter Han and ending with the 18th year of the Kuai Yuan era, common era 730. Cyclic sign Kano, Kanouma in the reign of Emperor Tzu Tsung of the Tang and uh, all of the Buddhist teachings were introduced to China. So, uh, by cyclical year 730, that includes the advent of Tendai, or Qi, in uh, the uh, mid-7th century, 645, 630, uh, somewhere in there, I'd have to look it up. The contents of these sutras, rules of monastic discipline, and treatises can be divided into the categories of Hinayana, the early uh, teachings, sometimes Hinayana meaning small vehicle, and Mahayana teachings, and within the Mahayana there are provisional Mahayana and true sutras. 
and exoteric and esoteric sutras, and one should carefully distinguish between them. So he's not casting anything out. Um, I've had some comments um, from people who who have seen my uh, in some of my videos and some of my comments on Cora. Um, they are practicing Theravada or have questions about other forms of Buddhism and uh, sometimes hear me as criticizing them. Um, I'm following in Nietzsche's footsteps and I'm not trying to denigrate. What I'm trying to do is demonstrate that they need to be careful to observe what it is they're practicing and that it isn't the correct teaching for today. So this Go Show is very meaningful to me um, and I want to make sure none of you are offended by any of this, no matter what you practice. Um, but you have to be aware uh, that, again, Buddhism was taught in varied states and stages, depending on who it was taught to. And we're now, 2,600 years later or so, in the latter day of the law, firmly, um, we must practice the most complete, most evolved, most comprehensive form of Buddhist method. Um, and as Buddha admonishes, and I say it all the time, you have to study all of it. I'm not trying to tell anyone, just study the Lotus Sutra, that's the only one to read, you can't read anything else. I don't think you can fully understand the Lotus Sutra unless you study uh, at least all the other Mahayana. It's even helpful to go back to the beginning, and what you'll see is a lot of repetition that you'll see again in the Mahayana. So it's not excluded. It's just built upon, okay? So this is, I say all that, uh, because this is what Nichiren is doing here. Um, Such designations did not originate with the latter scholars, like we're sometimes accused of, and teachers of Buddhism. They derived from the preaching of the Buddha himself. So this is interesting scholarship here. <clears throat> Therefore, they should be employed without exception by all living beings in the worlds of the Ten Directions. Anyone who fails to do so should be regarded as non-Buddhist. That's a pretty harsh admonition, don't you think? So, the custom of referring to the teachings of the Agama Sutras as Hinayana derives from the various Mahayana Sutras of the correct and equal wisdom and lotus and nirvana periods. In the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha says that if he had preached only the Hinayana teachings and withheld the Lotus Sutra, he would have been guilty of stinginess and greed. Moreover, the Nirvana Sutra states that those who accept only the Hinayana Sutras and declare that the Buddha is characterized by impermanence will have their tongues fester in their mouths. This is pretty explicit stuff. I want you to understand that you may ask yourself, well, what's wrong with understanding Buddha as an impermanent thing? I mean, that's, that's what he was, right? He was a man. He, he was enlightened to the Buddha mind, the Buddha life state, mind state, and then he passed away. So wasn't that justification for what he taught, that everything is impermanent? <clears throat> Certainly that's a lesson you can derive from it. But I want you to understand, and I need to go into this so that you understand this clearly, what Nichiren is saying here is that these earlier teachings, and this is the, the big pitfall of the Hinayana teachings, um, even though today, like Theravada schools will include the Lotus Sutra, they don't give it primacy. They still continue to have this, you have to understand that to see the Buddha characterized by impermanence is to be clearly attached to personhood, thingness, the Buddha as man, this is what Hinayana misses. This is what derives all the schools that say that full enlightenment only happens after death, after you leave this body, after you leave this life, like Buddha did, right? But they're missing the point. 
they're looking at the finger and they're not looking at the moon that the pinker finger is pointing to. The finger pointing at the moon. Remember that story? It's not that the Buddha was impermanent, it's that the human body was impermanent. Buddha, the Buddha mind, is something constantly extant. It's already here. It is the fundament of what everything is manifested from. This universe is Buddha. I'm trying to let that sink in for a moment. Buddha... Shakyamuni Buddha's appearance in the world was to demonstrate to us that as human beings, we can attain this perfect, full enlightenment, detached completely from this samsaric human condition. But you can only experience that while you're in it, in this Buddha, in this mind, in this human form. Once our body expires and we're gone, our consciousness is gone, there's nothing to perceive this Buddha reality, this Buddha mind, this truth. You can only experience it while alive as a human. This is huge. This is why Mahayana spends so much time talking about how the mind works. So you can start to dissect it and understand that it's not based on anything extant, real, permanent. That's impermanence. And only Mahayana gets into this. Only the latter teachings. And not until you get to the Lotus Sutra it does Buddha himself declare that this is extant in everyone, including women, which isn't said in any other sutra. So you ladies, you should be Mahayana Buddhists, right? So this is critical. Now, I said my piece on that, so let's let Nichiren continue. Second is the matter of capacity. One who attempts to propagate the teachings of Buddhism must understand the capacity and basic nature of the persons one is addressing. The Venerable Shariputra attempted to instruct a blacksmith by teaching him to meditate on the vileness of the body and to instruct a washerman by teaching him on the conduct uh, of breath-counting meditation. Even though these disciples spent over 90 days in their respective meditations, they did not gain the slightest understanding of the Buddha's teachings. On the contrary, they took on erroneous views and ended by becoming ichantikas, or per persons of incorrigible disbelief. Ah, oh, this stuff doesn't work. It'll never work. That's terrible. Not just that they took on those erroneous views, but that the teacher kind of set them up. This is his point. The Buddha, on the other hand, instructed the blacksmith in breath counting meditation. Makes more sense. A blacksmith's very physical. Counting breaths as he's pounding on steel makes sense, right? And the washerman in the meditation on the vileness of the body, constantly dealing with the filth of humans in clothing, right? And as a result, both obtained understanding in no time at all. If even Shariputra, the foremost in wisdom among the disciples of Buddha, failed to understand people's capacity, then how much more difficult must it be for ordinary teachers today, in the latter day of the law, to have such an understanding? Ordinary teachers who lack an understanding of people's capacity should teach only the Lotus Sutra to those who are under their instruction. So this is where some sects and some groups take it to mean that we can't teach anything else, just teach the Lotus Sutra. I can see where in this translation of uh, his Gosho, don't know exactly how he worded it. I'm not Japanese, uh, so I don't have the fortune to be able to understand and read his exact writings. But what I will say is that I'm sure, just having studied enough or as much Buddhism as I have, and Nichiren's writings, that his point is specific to the teacher and who they're teaching. 
Okay, so if you're a teacher, and this goes more to uh, the Bodhisattva life, the Bodhisattva life starts at the minute you start studying. And when you start and you begin to study Buddhism, you don't understand it all. You have a good idea, but you rely on your teachers and other sources because you're still studying, right? As I am, I've been doing this 40 years and I continue to grow every day. So what's my point? My point is that if you're uncertain, if you're not uncertain, even if you feel certain, but you're, you doubt yourself, am I teaching this correctly? I don't want to lead people to erroneous views. That's horrible. You can rest assured that if you teach just the Lotus Sutra, you will be doing the Buddha's work. You will not fail. It will then be up to your student to pick up the pieces and either they will go beyond the Lotus Sutra or they will stay there until such time as they need further knowledge. I did this myself. It didn't take me long in reading the Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, to think, I got to know where, what this really means. I got, I, I'm that kind of person. I got to dig. I got to know how things are built. Uh, and I have found that there were many other sutras that gave me aha moments. Oh, now I get what he's saying in the Lotus Sutra. Because the Lotus Sutra does have a huge assumed knowledge base. It's the culminating teaching. And I believe that if you're a student, now see, I'm qualifying who I'm talking to. If you're a student of Buddhism, if you're studying Buddhism and you're trying to understand the Lotus Sutra, Go and read the Lankavatara and come back to the Lotus Sutra. Go and read the Vimalakirti. Go and read the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. The Diamond, the Heart, all of those. In the perspective of some a student of the Lotus Sutra. And you will find, you will understand so much more depth than the Lotus Sutra. Because you've studied the, the prerequisites. The prior teachings. I'm not telling you to run off and, and be a Lankavatara Buddhist. I'm saying that reading and understanding that earlier text will open m windows of understanding in your mind that when you come back to the Lotus, you'll say, oh, now I get this. Now I get the meaning of what this is. I'm trying to get you to analyze the moon and the stars Don't stay stuck on the fingers. So here again, he adopts the question and answer form because he thinks people are going to ask me this question, so I'll answer it, right? Question, what about the passage in the Lotus Sutra that says, do not preach this sutra to persons who are without wisdom? Good question, right? And the answer from Nietzsche is, when I speak of understanding capacity, I'm referring to preaching by a person of wisdom. Again, one should preach only the Lotus Sutra even to those who slander the law so that they may establish a so-called poison drum relationship with it. In this respect, one should proceed as Bodhisattva never disparaging. Okay, never disparaging. In other words... Uh, they may be slandering the lotus and, and your practice and, and what you do, but you should never resort to that back at them. Instead, continue to sound the teachings of the lotus. Don't teach them anything else to say, no, if you teach it, then you'll get it. You can stop at slandering. That's useless. You just need to be, a to them, a poison drum. Lotus Sutra, Lotus Sutra, no, no, Lotus Sutra. Because if you do that, it will continue to work. You're awakening, you're planting that seed, you've heard this said, in their mind that will eventually grow and they will get curious and they will do their own path of study to get there. But you can't give them a false flag, a false direction, because they'll accept that as your point of view and that will lead them astray and they will never get to the truth. Does that make sense? Again, one should preach only the Lotus Sutra, even those who slandered, poison drum, proceed as Bodhisattva never dis disparaging did. However, if one is speaking to persons who one knows have the capacity to become wise, you know this, then one should first instruct them in the Hinayana. 
teachings, then instruct them in the provisional Mahayana teachings, and finally instruct them in the true Mahayana. There it is. This, this is what I've been saying all along. But if speaking to those one knows to be ignorant persons of lesser capacity, then one should first instruct them in the true Mahayana teachings. In that way, whether they choose to believe in the teaching or to slander it, they will still receive the seeds of Buddhahood. There's the seeds thing. But see, if, you're, if I know that you're a student, you're determined to know what this is about. Maybe you've been practicing other forms of Buddhism for a while, but you, 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 something I said or something you read about the Lotus Sutra piqued your interest. You said, there, I think there's something here. I think that I like what you're saying. Well, I know that you're a curious mind and a seeking spirit and a, 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 a person capable of study. If I have confidence that you're capable of study, I'll teach the Lotus Sutra, but I will also tell you, read this text. That will help you. That will open some doors of understanding and bring you better understanding and meaningfulness to the Lotus Sutra practice. Namo myo kyo. I don't abandon the Lotus. I'm just trying to teach the scholarship. I'm all about the scholarship. The students that I receive are people seeking scholarship. I also get people who are just, they want something to save them in their life. They don't know what they're doing. They're bouncing from psychotherapy to Jung to Christian to Baptist to whatever. They're looking for answers. I have to be careful about giving them false directions. So I immediately teach them how to chant Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Then we work on Gangyo. And at some point, they're going to either pick up on that or they're going to leave. And if they pick up on it, then they'll have meaningful questions. And then I can start to, I can show in the Lotus how they're answered. But if that's not sufficient, then I can start to go to other scholarship. Is that helpful? Third, is the consideration of time. Anyone who hopes to spread the Buddhist teachings must make certain to understand the time. For example, if a farmer were to plant his fields in autumn and winter, then even though the seeds in the land and the farmer's efforts were the same as ever, this planting would not result in the slightest gain, but would rather end in a loss. If the farmer planted one small plot in that way, he would suffer a minor loss. And if he planted acres and acres, he would suffer a major loss. But if he plows and plants in the spring and summer, then, whether the fields are of superior, medium, or inferior quality, each will bring forth its corresponding share of crops. Interesting analogy, huh? So the preaching of the Buddhist teachings is similar to this. If one propagates the teaching without understanding the time, one will reap no benefit but on the contrary, will fall into the evil paths. When Shakyamuni Buddha made his appearance in this world, he was determined to preach the Lotus Sutra. But though the capacities of his listeners may have been right, the proper time had not yet come. Therefore, he spent a period of more than 40 years without preaching the Lotus Sutra, explaining, as he says in the Lotus Sutra itself, that the time to preach so had not yet come. The day after the Buddha's passing begins the thousand-year period known as the former day of the law, when those who uphold the precepts are many, while those who break them are few. The day after the end of the former day of the law marks the beginning of the thousand-year period known as the middle day of the law, when those who break the precepts are many, while those without precepts are few. And the day after the ending of the middle day of the law begins the 10,000 year period known as the latter day of the law. That's where we are. When those who break the precepts are few, while those without precepts are many. In other words, the, the, all the admonitions and, and rules that were put early on to early students 2,600 years ago, monastic practice and isolation and all that, uh, that has all these two hundreds of precepts, but today we don't have, we don't have that anymore. We don't our cultures don't follow that kind of learning and stricture anymore. Uh, 
partly because we don't need it, and partly because uh, our cultures move move in a very different way now, and the people have a very different capacity to learn. A lot of things that they were trying to understand then are just taken for granted now. Okay, so during the former day of the law, one should cast aside those who break the precepts or who have no precepts at all, giving alms only to those to uphold the precepts. That was appropriate. During the middle day of the law, one should cast aside those without precepts and give alms only those to those who break them. And I'm running out of power. All right. So, I'm going to take a break there, and we'll continue this in part two. Thanks for playing along. I think this is a very involved uh, go show, very meaningful. Thank you for being here. Namo myoho renge kyo.